This is the grave of David Beatty. Since I get this question a lot, this is the biggest stone I've ever cleaned by myself. It took me right around an hour. I know some of you might say that you like the mossy look on this particular stone. The issue with moss and large stones like this is that it can weaken the connection between the obelisk and the base, and the obelisk can fall, which could hurt somebody, damage graves, and so on. David died at the age of 50 in 1871 of typhoid fever. He was a farmer and he was married to a woman named Nancy. They had three documented children, George, Ida, and Charles. A lot of times when I'm researching, I just let the research kind of guide me, and in this case, I ended up on several rabbit holes pertaining to their three children. Their son, George, is buried in this plot. He died at the age of 29 of, you guessed it, tuberculosis. Their daughter, Ida, married but doesn't seem to have had any children. She died at age 84 in 1942. I started looking into their son, Charles. He seems to have the first divorce I've come across in researching graves. He was married to a woman named Emma, and if you remember way back, I did a video cleaning the grave of two sisters with the last name Flower, named Cynthia and Laura. Emma was their sister. Emma and Charles had one son, Harry, who was born in 1880. As of 1892, Emma was married and living with another man in Hoosick Falls, New York, and her son Harry was with her as well. As of 1900, Charles was living in Troy, New York. He was in a boarding house and was listed as unable to work. In 1910, he entered the Alms House for the Poor and Indigent. His intake paperwork indicated that he could not work due to complications from varicose veins. Left untreated varicose veins can be very uncomfortable and painful and can lead to more serious problems or be an indication of a serious circulatory problem. Charles died three years later at the age of 57. His cause of death is just listed as a result of a fall, but I couldn't find any more details than that. He's also buried in this plot with his father and his mother. Charles's ex-wife, Emma, lived until 1920, dying at the age of 68. Their son, Harry, lived his life in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and died in 1962 at the age of 81. The stone's come a long way in even just a week, and here's a close-up of the detail. Here's a before and after, pause to view. Today I'm sharing the grave of Merritt Aldrich. Merritt died in September 1875 at the age of nine months. He was his parents' third child to be born and their third child to die before reaching the age of one. He's buried here with his sister Lizzie and his brother George. Lizzie died in 1870 at the age of eight months of whooping cough and measles. George died in 1873 at seven months of cholera infantum, a sickness that afflicted children in the summer that was likely caused by unpasteurized milk. I couldn't find Merritt's cause of death, but it was likely also some kind of infectious disease. At the time Merritt died, the child mortality rate in the United States was around 325 deaths per 1,000 births. So that means out of 1,000 children born, around 32.5% of them did not survive to the age of 5. Merritt's parents were named Hartwell and Sarah Aldrich. Hartwell, or Hart as he's sometimes referred to, fought in the Civil War, joining in 1862 and leaving in 1863. He became a mail carrier and later an express agent. Apparently an express agent is somebody who guards gold and silver that's being transported via the railroad. After losing three children over the span of about five years, it doesn't look as though they had any other documented children. Hartwell died in 1880 of typhoid pneumonia. He was just 45 years old. His wife, Sarah, first moved in with her parents and later would move in with a sibling and that sibling's family. She never remarried and died in 1904 at the age of 69 of paralysis, likely caused by a stroke. Merritt and his two siblings all have the same design on their stones. If you see at the top, it's a little clipping of a rose and there's a bud at the bottom of the carving symbolizes a life cut down before it was able to bloom. Here's how Merritt's stone is progressing. And here's his stone next to his siblings. This is the shared grave of twin sisters Callie and Cordy Sherman. 
Hallie's full name was Eliza Clatilla, and Cordy's was Cordelia after their mother. Callie and Cordy were born in July 1861 and died just two years later in 1863. They were two of ten children born to Benjamin Adolphus and Cordelia Sherman. Out of those ten children, only three of them would outlive their parents. Three of the girls' siblings, Charles, Fanny, and Rollin, are buried in this plot with them. Charles died at age two, Fanny died at age 17, and Rollin also died at age two. Their brother, Rupert, who was a farmer living in Michigan, died at the age of 23 of typhoid fever. Their sister, Flora, died in 1905 at the age of 31. And parents, Benjamin and Cordelia, died in 1913 and 1909, respectively. The remaining three siblings, Julia, Porter, and Ralph, all lived into middle or old age. Porter was a minister who worked as a missionary in India with his wife Charlotte for about 17 years. He's also buried in this plot with his family. This is the grave of Elizabeth or Lizzie Penny. If you followed me, you might remember that I cleaned the grave of a boy named Walter Penny. This is his mother. I'll show an update on his grave at the end of this video. Lizzie was just 23 in 1863 when she died of consumption or tuberculosis. I know I'm probably starting to sound like a bit of a broken record on that. It's a lot of consumption deaths from this time period. If you watched Walter's video, you know that Lizzie's husband, Alden, also died of consumption about eight years after losing his wife and his son. Lizzie was born in Weston, Massachusetts, and her maiden name is Wheelock, so you can see that her father and mother are actually buried behind her. Also in this plot is her sister, Ella, who died at age 40, just about 15 years after Lizzie died. If you watched Walter's video, you know that he had a pretty heart-wrenching epitaph inscribed on his stone, um, and Lizzie actually has one too, which tells me that Alden must have been pretty devastated, losing both his wife and son the same year. Lizzie's epitaph reads, Dear one, thou art gone forever. We no more thy voice shall hear. Gone to brighten clouds above us, far, far above all sin and care. Gravestone art and poetry around this time definitely focused more on mourning on the loss of the person and how that affected the people left behind that's in contrast to the graves of just about 50 years before this in the late 1700s and early 1800s at that point gravestone art as well as poetry really focused more on death and being prepared for death and remembering death always, rather than the kind of personal approach that you see in the mid to late 1800s. On a bigger scale, that kind of coincides with a time of increased spirituality, increased romanticism. It's kind of cool that you can actually see that transition depicted in the gravestones and the inscriptions that people chose for their loved ones. The carving on top of Lizzie's grave is actually a book a very common symbol for graves of this time. The most obvious reading of that symbol would be the Bible or the Book of Life, the Book of Death. Whatever the reason it was chosen by each individual person, um, it is a very common symbol for the time. As you can see, Lizzie's grave didn't rinse really well the first time around, so I'm gonna give this one some time um, to brighten up with the D2 solution. The redness here is temporary, it will go away. And here's Walter's grave. This is the grave of Hannah Atwood Hall. Hannah was 47 in 1861 when she died of typhoid fever. Hannah was married to a man named Pliny Hall. Pliny worked as a pattern maker making tools in Troy, New York. He and Hannah had two children, Chauncey and Hattie. After Hannah's death, Pliny took his two children and they moved out to Illinois. Specifically, they settled in Elgin, Illinois, where he continued to be a pattern maker. He got remarried and had quite a few more children. I started down a rabbit hole researching Hannah's two children. Once they went out to Illinois, Chauncey became a tinsmith making cans. Hattie joined the Elgin National Watch Company, where she became a watchmaker. Interesting thing about Hattie, who again is Hannah's daughter, it doesn't seem that she ever married or ever had any kids. She worked for the watch company her entire adult life, and she actually lived 
on the grounds of the watch company. They had a living quarters for factory workers. It held some 350 workers. And it seems she lived there until her death in the early 1900s um, in her 60s. I couldn't find much about Chauncey um, past the late 1800s or so. Hannah's husband, Pliny, also died in his 60s um, in the late 1880s. In all the records, it said that Pliny was born in Vermont, but looking through birth records, I couldn't find anyone with that name, at least on my first search. So I wonder if he started out with a different name or was born elsewhere. As you can see, Hannah's grave is already looking really nice. 